Thank you, Eugenia. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the fifth generation of wireless technology, aka 5G. And uh, it is, there's going to be a fundamental changes required to network infrastructure to you realize full potential of 5G. That's why we think it's an inflection point. And why do we need these changes in wireless because, uh, infrastructure? Because of the trends in industry, which is putting lots of uh, pressure on the network workload, and also emerging uh, exciting and new use cases. So what I, I like to do is always start with why. Why now? Why is 5G suddenly becoming so important? If you look at, it starts a little bit with Internet of Things. So if you look at Internet of Things or IoT and go to three buckets of things, network and cloud, you can see that it's projected that there are tens of billions of devices. I don't think anybody can agree about the right exact number. There are going to be 200 billion plus sensors coming online. And a majority um, of these devices, things, and sensors are not connected yet. So imagine what happens when you start bringing these billions of things, connecting them to the network. And these devices are going to create a lots of data, zettabytes of data. So the question of why now, why is IAT, IoT suddenly so prevalent, is because the cost of compute, storage, memory, and sensors have come down significantly during the past 10 years. Additionally, uh, the cost of bandwidth has come down, and broadband is becoming uh, more accessible and available at lower cost to many. So it has caused the IoT uh, to take off. So now uh, you're bringing these devices online. By the way, today's traffic, over 70% of it is dominated by video, so lots of high bandwidth uh, applications out there, which are, that's how we are overloading the network. Now you're bringing billions of devices on, uh, which are going to have a very different type of a data. They're going to be bursty, uh, they may not need all that um, uh, bandwidth, or they may be uh, event-driven. For instance, you can have a million gigabytes per day uh, connected factory can generate data, or a smart hospital can uh, generate about 4,000 gigabytes per day, and autonomous driving per car can generate about one gigabytes per second. So all this data is coming online, and only 5G uh, is going to be designed to address the scale and scope so we can uh, get insight from this data as you listen from the first two talks. We all need data to have insight and then monetize the data. So with the why, why now, let's now watch a short video on what is 5G. 5G. It promises to transform our lives in all kinds of different ways. But what is it exactly? It's often described as just the next step in the pursuit of an ever faster network. But in reality, 5G is much, much more. It's an entirely new technological foundation, purpose built to support the next great wave of life-changing digital advancements that will be enabled by our smart and connected future. From the safety and environmental benefits of autonomous driving to dramatic breakthroughs in artificial intelligence via machine learning and a whole new era in healthcare to a smart and connected revolution that will transform agriculture, manufacturing, cities, and our individual homes, even virtual and augmented reality. Every one of these promising new breakthroughs will be built on the common foundation of 5G, enabling billions of things to be made smart through seamless connectivity, massive computing power, and access to rich data and analytics stored at the eye of the cloud. All of which means one company is uniquely positioned to power 5G end to end. Intel. Um, IG, with 5G, you're going to have many opportunities to have a smart uh, 
type of a use cases. So there are three pillars if you want to look at the technology attributes. You have the human-to-human -human communication side of it, which is about enhanced mobile broadband. In this case, you need higher data rates in tens of gigabits per second, and you have to support higher capacity, i.e. multiple users per square kilometers. The other thing that 5G brings into the picture is about machine type communication. And that's what's different about this generation of wireless compared to the previous generations. Machine type communication breaks into two categories. One is you're going to have massive number of devices coming online which are going to have requirement for battery power operation. They may be hard to reach areas, like in the basement of the large building. And uh, they would, uh, would require, you know, there may be tens of kilobits per second of data, right? They're very uh, low complexity. And there are going to be lots of them. The other type of uh, machine type communication is called mission critical. In this case, you need high reliability and low latency communication. Um, uh, the quote is one millisecond. Some people challenge that with many nines depending on the application. So that's what's different about this generation of wireless communication. Before I go forward with what it is, I have to say Spectrum is the lifeblood of wireless. Without Spectrum, there is no wireless. So 5G encompasses license, unlicensed, and shared a license spectrum. And because we are going to introduce new spectrum to take advantage and make the potential of 5G re be realized, it has to be harmonized globally, i.e., uh, if I have a device that works in the US, I want the same device work in uh, Europe or in Asia. I don't need to have a dongle to, because of the different frequency bands. So that's uh, very important. So if you look at the three uh, segments, so one segment is less than 3 gigahertz for IoT application. This is a combination of licensed and unlicensed. Uh, such as Wi-Fi, which would be unlicensed. Uh, and then a lower frequency for long range, uh, low data rate applications. Then there is a middle part, which we said is more evolutionary, like LTE or higher uh, gigabits per second Wi-Fi, like Wi-Fi 6. Or the, there's a new spectrum becoming, uh, has become available at millimeter wave, uh, such as 28, 39 gigahertz for high capacity, high throughput, and even latency uh, sensitive applications. But to create a more of a global standard, there is a new interface, air interface is being introduced called 5G new radio or 5G NR, which will uh, encompass uh, from, let's say, less than a 1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz uh, spectrum. So it's a single internationally recognized spec for the 5G radio systems, which enable devices to connect opportunistically to networks so when they need it for based on their requirements. If we look at what uh, 5G NR is, it has a flexible uh, numerology. It means that the, there is a different subcarrier spacing. Uh, it is scalable. Uh, right now, release 15 for 3GBP standard. It goes up to 52.5 gigahertz. Um, and by release 17, um, in the standards, it's expected to go all the way to 100 gigahertz. It's uh, efficient. It's going to be dynamic time um, duplex. Uh, um, time division duplex, so you can have different up, up link, down link frames. Uh, it's going to be very responsive and low latency. You're going to have scalable transmission time interval. It has to be reliable. And of course, it's going to have very high data rates. It's bring that to you. So this standard is very important to create a harmonization of the air interface for this uh, broad range of frequencies, which is a first. So now let's uh, take a step back and say, OK, what are the, uh, some of the key uh, wireless technologies? So, so this, is a, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a sample of what are the, some of the 5G core technologies. 
Obviously, uh, massive input, massive output, MIMO antennas are going to be a very big deal from less than 6 gigahertz all the way into the millimeter wave for spatial capacity and uh, latency and users. New modulation and coding schemes, uh, talked about spectrum, low energy systems, it, regardless if you are a device or an infrastructure, you still have to have low energy systems. Uh, coordinated systems with a cloud radio access network or even silicon photonics, we just heard about that. There are going to be network virtualization, software defined networks, and point to point communication depending on the latency requirements. By the way, when 5G is there, you still have to support 4G, which has LTE, LTE Advanced, LTE Pro. You still have support 3G. In some countries, you still have to support 2.7 5G, 2.5G, Wi Fi. So, as you can see, there's a long list of protocols and, um, that needs to be addressed. So if you look at an example of a device, so some, um, which is more a constraint in terms of form factor and power, you have your five processing and the RF processor, so that's your COM processor. Um, you have your apps processor, uh, you have your power management, your COM management, you have your front end module, and as we add more protocols, you can see how complex that five will get. So what I'd like to do now is to go over some example for the PHY and the PIMIC, Power Management IC. I'm going to start on the technology, core technologies I showed you. I want to cover the low energy system part of it. These are the research that has been done at Intel Labs. They are pre-standard. And uh, so we're going to cover millimeter wave. We're going to cover a little bit on the IoT, on 5G NR, and on the PIMIC. So let's start with uh, millimeter wave. Uh, beam forming is very necessary for uh, spatial diversity and improving capacity and everything. So common architecture today is the analog beam forming, which you have uh, one RF chain with multiple uh, antenna elements with phase shifters to form the beam. This is the lowest cost, lowest power option. Uh, however, um, it, you get one beam, um, so for you to sear the sector, it takes longer time to do so. The hybrid beam forming, you still have the analog uh, beam forming, but on top of it, you overlay the digital beam forming, where you may have two or multiple RF chains. In this case, you may get uh, more than one beam, but you still have the, you're still using your phase shifter for beam forming and beam steering, so you still have a longer time to search. So the part that we are focusing in the labs is looking at fully digital beam forming, uh, where uh, each antenna, uh, each RF has one antenna element. Obviously, right there, you can say, well, the power and cost is going up, which is true. But you get very fast beam acquisition and f fast beam search. So the challenge here for us is how can we lower the power and cost of this architecture? What are the innovation required to do so? So one of the things we looked at, uh, if we make the hybrid beam forming as a baseline, um, you can see that the power is mostly on the uh, RF uh, front end, um, the interface, and a little bit of ADC, assuming the figure of merits of 2 picojoule per bit and uh, ADC figure of merit of about 25 uh, femtojoule per conversion and two streams. For a fully digital, now you're going to have, uh, uh, for this case, you can see that the I.O. interface between the ADC and the baseband is having the most power uh, consuming. So in this case, it's over 42%. Uh, uh, percent. And uh, the innovation we've done in our lab is to look at a, um, a new IP block uh, algorithm called blind spatial compression, um, utilizing the sparsity of the millimeter wave channel between the ADC and the baseband. And in this case, you can see that we can significantly reduce the power at the I.O. interface. We can go back to the two streams and make it the same as a hybrid. So the figure on the lower right-hand side shows that the power could become comparable 
to the uh, hybrid. So the idea is what other innovations are needed to lower the uh, power and costs for, for the digital architecture. So uh, one thing which is still very challenging for millimeter wave is the zero IF or direct conversion. But it's, we shouldn't write it off. We should still look at this technology very closely. And of course, the optimization between the IC antenna and uh, co-optimization to reduce the losses and parasitics. We can uh, no way underestimate the uh, significance of the process scaling. It's a very important um, part of reducing the power uh, for ADCs, for the IOs, and of course, uh, for the transceiver itself. So at Intel, uh, we've introduced a process called a 22 nanometer FFL, which was previously last year um, introduced at IEDM. And in this process, uh, what we have is that we have co-optimize, so we have the high uh, speed uh, digital transistors. We also have introduced RF analog transistors with a backend, um, thick layer backend for a low, uh, the high performance uh, reasonable Q passives. And uh, we have co-optimized the process for FT and FMAX, specifically for millimeter wave uh, application. You can optimize to get the highest FT, but you don't have the best FMAX, or vice versa. You can optimize for highest FMAX, but not low FT. But if you look at the blue region and the red region, you can see the diamonds, and that's a co-optimized FTF FMAX. This process is a FinFET process, and uh, it has a very reasonable uh, flicker of 1 over F noise for the design. So now we have a process. Now we want to do the fundamental blocks to show does it work. So we build this fundamental uh, low noise amplifiers and power amplifiers at 75 gigahertz, so really stressing it. Um, so in this case, we have a dual stage LNA with a noise figure of 4 dB and a gain of 20 dB, about 11 milliwatt. It's, it's, it's a very uh, actually set of art LNA. And we had to co-optimize uh, the design layout with the process, which is uh, not a surprise for RF people. Uh, but also, we have to significantly reduce the uh, parasitics, right? So the, the layout uh, and the number of fingers of the gaze, everything becomes very critical. We also build the um, dual stage uh, class uh, ABPA with the uh, power added efficiency of about 26.3%. And uh, 1 dB uh, compression um, at, at 5.7 dBm with a gain of 16.5 uh, dB. So process can do it. Now let's put the things, pieces together to create a transceiver. But before going there, so uh, we have a short integration. We can do the digital plus the RF plus the analog plus the passives. The other thing is we have to be scaled. We want to create beamforming, so we have to create phase arrays. So uh, we can have multiple transceivers per uh, on a die. We can have multiple die uh, per package, and we can have multiple package inside a package. So uh, with this scheme, you're able to scale as to have as many antennas as we need for our application. So what we've done. Uh, we built the, this uh, millimeter wave phase array in the 22 nanometer um, RF process. And there is a paper, um, 9.7, and there is a demo. So I really encourage you to go and uh, listen and watch this. This is a zero IF direct conversion um, design uh, with a record millimeter wave FinFET um, performance. And uh, we're going to use this as a foundation for our uh, looking at fully digital architecture. So it's doable. You can do it. You can scale it. You can form it. Um, so I encourage you to go and listen to this paper. Uh, now switching gears. So that's the high frequency millimeter side. So now let's go the IoT side. So with IoT, as I said, you have billions of things online, and they're going to uh, going to be waking up and uh, <coughs> transferring the data. So the low uh, power wake up radio is a concept that is event driven, meaning that it will only wake up your main radio when there is a packet ready for it. So the Wi-Fi part is currently being standardized in 802.11ba. Um, and the cellular wake-up radio is going through the standard process for the 3GPP. 
And um, so let's uh, take a step and uh, go through and which one is. So in the cellular wake-up uh, radio, um, the, in this case, the radio, the RF, is the same for both um, the receiver and for the main um, radio, LTE radio in this case. So, but when a packet, but the baseband is uh, put to sleep. But when a packet arrives, uh, then the main radio wakes up the baseband and it goes to sleep. So what, uh, as I said, this is going through the standardization process. Our simulated results shows that we can save power somewhere between 30% to 10x based on the protocol. So narrowband IoT or different uh, CAT, which is a different data rates, with latency of four seconds. So this could be very advantageous for um, IoT devices, which are going to run on um, um, cellular um, IoT. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the, in this case, it's a Wi-Fi example. It can also apply to Bluetooth or other protocols. Uh, we worked, looked at Wi-Fi. Um, the simulation upper left-hand corner shows that uh, with the wake-up receiver, in this case, it's a, your main radio, RF radio, is in sleep, and you have a receiver uh, which is listening for the data coming in. The simulated results shows that for a latency of about uh, 100, um, 150 milliseconds, we can have as much as 220x saving in power. That's a quite a bit. And if you go to high latency, five seconds, you can save as much as seven X in power. So this was very intriguing, very interesting. So we built um, this radio in our 40 nanometer process using on and off key, uh, keying, uh, basically trying to uh, uh, emulate uh, of the Wi-Fi process. By the way, with these radios, you cannot impact the Wi-Fi operation or the Bluetooth operation. So you still have those constraints um, available to you. Uh, superimposed to you. So the power uh, of this was 95 microwatts with a sensitivity of minus 7 in 2, gain of 37. Um, so it's good, uh, and we can do better. We are looking at this further to improve these uh, parameters more. So uh, exciting area, uh, which helps the IoT side. Now switching gears, let's talk about 5G NR, so the new radio. Um, in this case, uh, we built an SOC called Wireless Processing Engine. This is the pre-standard spec for 5G NR, so it's the next generation. And it supports a dynamic TDD and self-contained frame structure. And it has uh, two uh, 300 megahertz cores, um, three megabytes of undi SRAM, um, both Phi and Mac layers are on the, on the die, uh, on this baseband. And uh, we had to co-design the algorithm and architecture together to get the best optimized uh, power performance. Uh, the spec for the system is given there. Uh, the interesting thing is you're going to have different bandwidths, 10, 20, up to 100 megahertz, with uh, uh, up to... Um, uh, 50 megabits per second on data rate. This is a 5.9 gigahertz um, of operation frequency aimed for V2X vehicle to anything application, which is one of the critical use cases for uh, 5G. Now here latency is important and, uh, and reliability. So we had the, the spec case for less than 100 meter up to five nines and uh, between 100 to 300, uh, three nines, and 300 to 500, or half a kilometers, uh, two nines reliability, uh, with a latency of one millisecond for five, and five millisecond at app layer. So we build this, it works, and uh, we are doing some um, uh, other demos with it. And finally, coming to the power management. Power management, PMIC, is one of the most important part of any uh, design any device because we have so many voltages that are coming on um, into the chips. Uh, in this case, if you look at your smartphones, your form factor limited, uh, not only in XY, but also in Zs. You have a Z height limitation. So uh, it's very important to have innovative uh, power delivery for improving uh, efficiency area 
and cost. So uh, what we've done, uh, the team has done, uh, there are three papers that I encourage you strongly to go and listen to, three different types of uh, voltage regulators, uh, one flying capacitor for multi-level converter, which addresses high efficiency and high power density, uh, one paper on fully integrated buck regulator, in this case the inductor is embedded in the package, for high efficiency and high bandwidth. And finally, hybrid um, analog digital linear regulator to, um, that eliminates some of the discrete, uh, discrete capacitors for area efficiency. Um, so if you're in power management, I strongly encourage you to go and um, listen to these papers. So now going into the front end module and antenna side of it, um, it is very important to co-optimize the RFIC with the matching network, with the antenna and the, all the feed throughs. You're gonna have lossy package, especially PCB boards where you build your antennas. And uh, so we, not, we need to minimize the mutual coupling, line losses, uh, create more isolation um, between the lies. Uh, so with that, uh, there was an example um, last year. Um, it's a concurrent, um, dual polarized MIMO transceiver the team showed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Donishkar uh, from Interlabs uh, did make this presentation. Here you can see that the uh, RFIC was uh, co-designed with the antenna and the network, uh, matching network, you can see the matching network. The antenna was um, um, uh, built both horizontal and vertical uh, polarization in the PCB and with a very careful design to minimize losses and parasitics, we were able to achieve eight gigahertz of bandwidth uh, with a dual um, simultaneous polarization. The team has a new paper um, this year, which I also encourage you uh, to attend. Um, in this case, uh, we are going for even wider bandwidth uh, using a polar transmitter and uh, using a quad feed antenna to optimize the complete, again, RF matching network and the antenna uh, processes from 57 to 71 gigahertz, so the 14 gigahertz bandwidth. And they were uh, able to achieve very impressive results of uh, more than 50% improvement from last year in the data rate and about 2.5x uh, less power, um, picojoule per bit for power efficiency. So again, it just shows you by co-optimization, co-design, what you can achieve um, as we move forward. So um, going into conclusion, 5G is really not just another G. It is more than human-to-human -human communication. Uh, it brings in for the first time uh, machine type communication protocols that specifically addresses machine to machine and machine to human communication. Imagine billions of things coming on the online. How are you going to manage that? Um, and then you're going to have different um, reliability, latency, all these autonomous industrial 4.0, autonomous driving, all of this come into the picture. So uh, that's what 5G is supposed, potentially is supposed to address. It has addresses very diverse and uh, divergent requirements. So you have the wide area network going all the way to IoT, uh, which is uh, lower data rates, uh, different type of a latency, uh, longer range or shorter range depending on uh, many, many devices to all the way to millimeter wave with higher frequency, uh, lower latency, shorter range. So there is very, very large and diverse requirements. Therefore, we need to innovate from all the way from the system down to the core technology. So at Intel, um, we do uh, power, we look at this problem from end to end and we do power the 5G end to end from devices to seamless access through all uh, radio access technologies, looking at uh, access and core networks, and of course cloud for a uh, data center for analysis with a uh, portfolio of uh, products with, which is feeds into this end to end. 
So on the, specifically on 5G, uh, we, we are uh, developing a robust silicon roadmap. Um, in this case, we have trial platforms because th this is a new protocol uh, with a very different frequencies coming in line, so it's very important to build it. And um, so we've been working with our partners, telecom op operators, uh, uh, telecommunication uh, providers, and other industry partners to build and try and see what else, uh, what are the areas that needs more improvement. So we call that mobile uh, trial platform. We also have Intel Go for the automotive side of it. We're working on uh, modems, um, uh, very uh, broad portfolio of processes, and of course, uh, full programmable um, gate arrays. So uh, one of the uh, questions I get is what's next? By the way, 5G is not done yet, obviously. Uh, we just, uh, last June was release 15. There are two more releases uh, coming for 5G. And any, if you look at any protocol, it takes about 10 years to pick. So 4G is going to be with us for a while, but 5G is coming on board to address the need of machines. Um, and of course, higher um, data rate and enhanced mobility, as I said, because the majority of the traffic is video today, so we need the bandwidth. So what is next is, if you look at that network again, and that circle says, uh, at the edge of the network, you can stretch it now. Uh, because your radio access network now ha butts, uh, abuts to the devices, so you have this edge, which uh, the terminology used uh, is called multi-access edge compute, so MEC. In this case, you have uh, devices which are coming on board and creating data. You saw that, uh, a lot of data. Uh, at the edge, and then you have devices, um, and also you have data going into the network, so uh, closer to the network hub or regional data center. So this edge network, um, uh, you can do analytics for real-time low latency at the edge, or if you don't have that latency requirement, you can go all the way um, to the, uh, for the cloud computing. Uh, so you need the AI. You heard the first two uh, keynotes today on why AI is important, why learning uh, is uh, different types of learning is important. So one is to, for data analytics side of it, for things you're measuring and need to respond and actuate and control. The other part of learning is also for the wireless network itself. Can I uh, do learning so I have a more effective network, more efficient network with more optimized workload balance? So uh, we believe with 5G and AI, uh, we can unleash uh, even further uh, new opportunities for all. With that, thank you very much.